What is the future of water? How can we get involved in new projects, new initiatives to address the, the pressing problems around water, ranging from pollution to uh, water shortage to water in conflict? These are some of the questions that have sparked off the Future of Water for Project, which is a collaboration in the first place with Harvard University, who have developed a course called the Idea Translation Lab. And we have a new course and some fantastic students here in Trinity who have been working in the Idea Translation Lab course here. And one of the reasons these partners have got together is because they think that um, addressing the world's water problems requires collaborations between new kinds of partners. We need to involve not only scientists and engineers but also artists and designers in uh, exploring uh, how we can create new solutions around water. Finder. It's a free smartphone application. It's fast, it's fun, it's the future. What we want to do is we want to decrease our bottled water usage to enhance Dublin tourism by allowing tourists to work out where is the nearest uh, freshwater availability. We've come to learn how much water that's actually used in the production of the plastic that makes bottled water itself. Why waste water when we have perfectly fresh water available to us? Our project is to make an exhibition in Electric Picnic that would make uh, tea out of rainwater. There'll be a rainwater capturing system from the roof. The filtration mechanism will be visible to everyone that goes into it and you'll see the workings of it and how rainwater can be effectively filtered and then you'll be given a cup of tea and we'll have a chat with you and tell you how you can use rainwater in your own home. We've been working on a water purification tablet called Purifit. It's also enriched with vitamins and it's flavoured. Backpackers who are travelling, the purification tablets taste awful and they need access to clean water supplies. It can also be used in the developing world. It purifies the water, it flavours it and it also gives them vitamins that supports their balanced diet. I think um, the course had quite an important message to think critically about what we're told and what we would, as a developed country, think would work in, in different situations that we don't really understand. You're looking at news websites and you kind of see these things that catch your eye and you'd be thinking, you know, that could have something to do with my course. I think some of the speakers we've had in have been just really unusual to, well, I study science, so really different from what I kind of be used to hearing. Certainly, my course is it's very, you do all your stuff by yourself. Um, whereas this course is, is teamwork. It was just so interesting to see that um, scientists and artists and all sorts of different people can think together and think differently but, but think in the same sort of direction and with the same goal in mind and, and kind of come to um, more rounded sort of solutions to problems by mixing fields of study. I'm thrilled to have her here today and I would like now to hand you over to Dr Mary Robinson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, and good morning. I've known Michael since he was quite a small boy, so he still looks young to me, but um, uh, I'm delighted to be back here in the Science Gallery and uh, connecting the Science Gallery with the uh, work of uh, our foundation on climate justice, because there is a huge connection, and water uh, will be very much part of that connection today. I was impressed by the video, and I'm really glad that there are serious projects that students are involved in, and indeed the link with Harvard uh, students. And I'll want to stay in touch with these projects as, uh, as you go forward. Uh, because, uh, as you mentioned, Michael, uh, water is both a crucial element and there's a huge inequity and unfairness about it. Uh, the U UN, in this um, UN day of specially focusing on water, reminds us that about a billion people don't have access to safe drinking water in our world today, and that 2.5 billion don't have access to proper sanitation, and that because of climate impacts, more people in this century, maybe another billion or so, will suffer terrible water stress. So it's not a problem that we're on top of and uh, that we don't have to worry about. It's actually an issue that we need to worry about in both developed and developing countries. And it's one of the issues that I was thinking a lot about when um, I was uh, putting together in my head, first of all, and then with my colleagues, um, this foundation on climate justice. But before I get onto that, you may have noticed that um, I had a, an encounter with my beautiful six-year-old granddaughter. We were having great fun together, and then I missed a step, and the two of us fell, 
And we both thought it was very funny initially, but unfortunately it wasn't too funny. I cracked a wrist. And now I'm learning the skill of taking a one-handed shower. It's not nearly as easy as you might think, but it makes me think a lot about water. Um, I was in Bangladesh recently uh, at the invitation of BRAC, B-R-A-C, which is possibly the largest NGO in the world and does a great deal of good work um, on tackling poverty, on microcredit, um, on women's empowerment, not only in Bangladesh and in Afghanistan and Haiti, but in a number of countries of Africa as well. And they're working with us now on principles of climate justice. But I've traveled to the Delta region um, of Bangladesh with my BRAC colleagues and also saw a very good concern project for the Bay of Bengal and um, four provinces of Bangladesh and two in India, um, which are affected by sea surge, the aftermath of cyclones in particular, and a general problem of uh, gradual seawater rise. I traveled for the first time in my life in a seaplane, which was a bit of excitement, and we took off from a normal airport, but then landed on a river. And before we landed for at least half an hour of our, our flying time, we were flying over land that had been inundated by water. And we could see from the seaplane, which wasn't too high up, the number of people living on embankments and surrounded by water. It was, it was really incredible to fly over. And uh, when we landed and uh, were taken to the nearest village, I, I first of all went to a local school, but then we went to meet local people to see how they were coping with the aftermath of a cyclone, Cyclone Isla, that had hit uh, just two years ago. And one of the problems, in fact, was lack of effective local government. So the embankments that had been broken by the sea surge were not being properly reconstructed. And people were not being housed properly. And you had a number of NGOs trying to cope with this situation and trying to help people to learn new livelihoods because the salinated water was still there in the fields and it was dest had destroyed the agricultural land. So the people could no longer grow rice in the way they were growing it traditionally. They had to learn to grow maize, which was more tolerant. They had to learn to grow sesame seed and a few other um, crops. And it had also destroyed the inland fishing, um, which had provided um, food security for these uh, people so that they, uh, th 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 there was a possibility of fattening crabs. And we watched a man immersed up to his waist in water, fattening crabs. And I just wondered, you know, how his toes were coping with standing in water with lots of crabs that he was fattening. Um, he was Hindu, and most of the population, being Muslim, wouldn't eat crab, and therefore it wasn't really a good livelihood for them. But um, it, it wasn't causing any uh, ethnic or religious friction. It was just um, a, a, a factual matter. But it meant that Brack, who were helping the crab fattening, had to find a market for the crabs in an area where there were more Hindu and others who, who would like to eat crabs. And that was uh, one of the challenges, if you like. What was really brought home to me was, um, apart from that, um, the huge gender dimension of the situation. Because women, when they spoke, talked about having to go much further for safe water, and the hours in the day it took up. And it is part of something that we've been very aware in establishing a foundation on climate justice, that when you have climatic impacts that are undermining subsistence farmers and those who live in uh, conditions where weather changes can have a huge impact, um, then the uh, way in which this impacts on women and men is actually different because of different household responsibilities, different farming responsibilities, different child caring and uh, community responsibilities. And it becomes much more severe um, on women and on their lives. Uh, I've learned a lot from uh, a group called Climate Wise Women. Uh, they were brought together initially before Copenhagen to take part in some tribunals around the world that Oxfam um, had organized. I'm still honorary president of Oxfam, and we work closely with Oxfam um, in now um, in the foundation and in our climate uh, work. And uh, uh, what Oxfam did was organize local hearings and then bring some of those who were most eloquent about their situation and willing to become um, sort of advocates for um, a bottom-up, human-centered approach to climate. 
And one of these I become um, a good friend of at this stage, um, uh, Constance O'Kellett from uh, Uganda. Uh, she tells the story of how uh, she grew up in a normal village. They were poor, but nobody was starving. They had quite a, a good village life. And then about five years ago, they began to notice the severity of the climate changes. And they'd noticed before, but these were really severe. And as she put it, and I, I think it's a, an interesting thing, you know, the way she tells it, she said, when we began to have um, no regular seasons, so farmers didn't know when to sow, we had heavy flooding and then drought for about six or seven months, and then the, the rains should have come. But instead of the rains coming in a normal way, we had heavy flash flooding, and it ran off the very dry ground. It had destroyed the school, etc. And then um, drought again for several months. And that's the way it is now. And she said, when this first happened, the first year, and when it was beginning to happen in the second year, we thought that God was punishing us. And then through Oxfam, she learned more about climate impacts and global warming. And she said, we learned it wasn't God that was punishing us. It was rich people. And I thought that was a very potent way of saying it. Uh, she captured the responsibility that it's our profligate overuse of carbon and our failure to uh, address the responsibility in that um, that is causing a worsening of the uh, climate uh, for uh, poor communities. And we, we, we can perhaps um, discuss this further. Um, it was the women's group with Constance in that village who came together and felt we have to hold our community together. We have to try and rebuild our school. We have to try and work on it. Again, showing the differential impacts. Not only does it have more severe impact on women, but very often it's women in a practical sense who will become the agents of change, who will organize to provide the risk reduction, to provide the adaptation techniques. And uh, that was one reason why uh, we felt in um, the uh, foundation, we call it MRFCJ after the, um, uh, after the initials, um, we felt in MRFCJ that one area we would focus on was the way in which women are impacted negatively but don't want to be just considered victims. They want to be agents for change, both at local community level and increasingly women are in positions of um, authority and influence in the context of climate. So we got a support from the Rockefeller Foundation to work um, leading up to the last big climate meeting, which was in Cancun in Mexico um, in uh, late November, early December. And we organized two women's groups, uh, two meetings. One was local um, uh, grassroots, indigenous, and NGOs who had been working for years to insert gender, language, and principles and values into uh, the preparations for um, the uh, conferences of the parties, the COPs. And at COP16 uh, in Cancun, um, we had the first meeting on the 4th of December of a number of um, uh, very uh, articulate and very informed women some of them coping in their communities, some of them coping from an NGO perspective, some of them academics, etc. And we did it with Wangari Mathai um, of, of Kenya and her Greenbelt um, uh, um, uh, initiative with the Nobel um, women and with the Climate Wise women. And the second meeting, um, my foundation hosted with the government of Mexico to bring women in power together. Uh, the president of that meeting in Cancun, the form, foreign minister of, um, uh, of Mexico, uh, Patricia Espinoza, the woman who was the executive and is the executive um, director of the UNFCCC process, Cristiana Figueres, um, the climate action uh, commissioner of the uh, European Union, Connie Hedegaard, Hedegaard and the ministers of Denmark and Ecuador. We tried to get South Africa, but unfortunately there was a a meeting of the, of the African group that clashing with our meeting, so we couldn't um, have South Africa in the lead. Um, but um, we, we had a very good discussion about the fact that women are in positions of authority as far as discussions on climate are concerned. And that continues now that South Africa will be hosting the next COP17 in Durban. I've just come from South Africa, where in fact my grandchild and I had this little encounter. Um, and uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs was about to go to Mexico and will be talking with Patricia Espinoza and hopefully will be interested in continuing um, highlighting the gender dimensions of climate, justice, and of water. Um, I just want to make 
um, a few comments about the structure of the foundation, which will reinforce the reason why I was so pleased to get this invitation to come to the Science Gallery this morning and to link with the future work that yeah, the students will be doing, both here and in Harvard, on a water initiative. Um, the foundation is linked with the um, Alliance of Innovation of both Trinity and UCD, and we have board members representing the two universities. And we're very keen to uh, support the innovative link between science and art that um, the gallery is also highlighting, because we come from a background of human rights, and you're talking economic, social, and cultural rights. There's a huge cultural dimension in many countries to water, and I think that's something that um, can also uh, come out. And very recently, the um, head of our um, uh, um, research and development of the foundation, Dr. Tara Shine, who is a scientist, um, addressed the Women in Science and Technology, WITS, on International Women's Day. And one of the issues that they discussed um, at that meeting and that she gave me feedback on during the Q&A was water. Um, it, it just became a real focus of um, interest and attention. So um, I'm very aware that water and food security are going to be incredibly key issues as we address climate justice over the coming years. Um, as well as continuing our gender dimension on climate, um, the foundation is also focusing on uh, how to um, uh, encourage more possibilities of poor countries developing their forestry under the red, the um, uh, no deforestation, no de de degradation um, uh, approach of the UNFCCC. And we've noted that basically no African countries, even though they have um, uh, forests um, in West Africa and elsewhere in Africa and the Congo Basin, etc., none of them are really benefiting significantly. And uh, there's a great deal of work to be done. So we're going to work with the African Climate Policy Center in Ethiopia which is a center established by the African Union, by the African Development Bank, and by the UN Economic Commission for Africa. It's actually based in the UN Economic Commission for Africa's headquarters in Ethiopia. And we've been developing a possible program to uh, bring some expertise from outside Africa, particularly from Guyana, which has been successful in developing a red program that's benefiting its population, um, to introduce this to some African countries. And we are uh, aware that in Durban we'll have to talk about how to ensure going forward as the Kyoto Protocol is coming to its end of its first phase, do we move into a second binding phase or do we have another way of having a binding agreement because we are very clear from a climate justice perspective, we're not going to have a balance of proper funding of adaptation, proper regulatory, ensuring that the rich world in particular and the emerging economies, the large emerging economies, um, are engaged in sufficient mitigation, transfer of technology, financing, etc. This needs um, a binding multilateral agreement. Cancun put the process back on track for that, but dodged most of the, most of the serious um, key issues. So um, it will be important, I think, going forward to bring out the justice dimension, and I'll just end with that. Um, how do we, in fact, uh, understand in a profound enough way that the world has only a limited carbon budget, that the part of the world that Ireland is located in and uh, richer parts of the world um, have used up far more than their fair share of this carbon budget? just at a time when it's so important for developing countries to be able to develop. And the way we developed was based on that um, fossil fuel, carbon-led um, growth. Uh, how do we urgently ensure that uh, the renewable technologies become available to the poorest so that they can have um, a growth that is not resource-heavy, and in particular on fossil fuel, but rather that they have access to uh, affordable, renewable energy as part of climate justice. These are huge issues. And how do we change our life habits, including our habits in relation to water that were well illustrated earlier, um, in order uh, to uh, use less of this limited carbon budget and have more equity and fairness in the situation? Um, I must say, for me, it's one of the biggest human rights issues of the 21st century. It's one that I'll be very much focusing on from a human rights perspective over the coming years. And I'm very keen, Michael, that 
we link with the Science Gallery. We link um, increasingly with uh, Trinity as one of our uh, universities under the Alliance of Innovation. But we link with all of the universities in Ireland. We, I've just been to Maynooth with Dr. Tara Shine. We had a very good discussion there. We will gradually build up, map out um, who's doing what on climate justice and climate issues generally and try to, to work together. It's also, I believe, an issue in which Ireland can be a bridge. Um, we have been going through extremely hard times in recent months, and it's your generation that's feeling it most, the younger, the student generation, and um, those who are seeking jobs in a really difficult environment at the moment. And we feel down about Ireland. We feel you know, that uh, in Brussels, Ireland is not discussed as the great success story, but rather how could they have got it so wrong? How could they have allowed this to happen, etc.? And we need areas where we can work well and with great integrity and authenticity. And we have, rightly, a very good reputation in the area of development. And I think this is something we can build on, build in the climate, build in the innovation, which uh, you're, you're, you're really showing in the initiative that you brought forward, and work together to show that um, Ireland can give le leadership in an area, and I think that area is climate justice. So I'd be delighted to discuss this now with you and to work with you in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.